We're in a whole new era of space exploration. In the 60s, in the heat of the Cold War, the Russians and the uh, U.S. used military vehicles to get to the bounds of space. On the uh, left you see the uh, X-15, which was launched from a B-52, went to the lower altitudes of space. On the right you see an intercontinental ballistic missile, the Titan II, configured for flying humans in space. In fact, uh, this was the, the mainstay of the Gemini program. Now fast forward 50 years. This whole new era has opened up in front of us. It is now no longer the realm of governments and military, but it rather it is the frontier for new entrepreneurs. On the, on the left you see Spaceship One, designed and built by Bert Rutan from Scale Composites. It's flown three times into space. It won the X Prize. The pilots that flew that spacecraft uh, earned their civilian astronaut wings. On the right side sp is uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, that has launched twice successfully to orbit the Falcon 9, a multi-stage rocket, and uh, on the last flight it actually returned a capsule safely to Earth, landing actually off the coast of California. So we are now in this new era of space exploration. This is, a, this is what the future holds where everybody has a chance to see this new frontier. Stephen Hawking, paralyzed with ALS, a brilliant physicist flying with Newton's apple in microgravity, in parabolic flight, experiencing the joys of space flight for 20 seconds or so, something that you all can experience. Imagine what he must have felt being no longer confined by gravity. This is the future we all have to look forward to. In March of this year, Felix Baumgartner, in the capsule shown at the top, was the third person to successfully free fall from the stratosphere above 70,000 feet, climbing in a, in a helium-filled balloon. Ten days later, James Cameron became the third person to successfully transit the deepest point on the Earth, the Marianas Trench, 38,000 feet in the Pacific Ocean. Both of these efforts were done by private entrepreneurs, and this is what the future holds. It's a whole new era of exploration. The heavens, the seas beneath us, all these different things now are in our, in our grasp, within our future, and our kids will have the benefit of, of this, this, the fruits of this labor. This is Mission Director. Beginning to insert Felix. Uh, Roger that. Flight Director 40,000. You let me know when you're ready to go. All right, Joe, let's do this. We're all crazy, but you know that's what it takes to do this. One mission, redefining borders. It's a huge milestone. One team with pioneering spirit. We're going into the next era in space. Godspeed, Felix. Here we go. One man with unlimited bravery. This is a really hostile environment, so it's dangerous. His life depends upon that pressure suit. Red Bull Stratus. Coming in 2012. We're on our way, Felix. I get choked up every time I see that. This was the first flight of the three flights that we plan in the stratosphere. What you see here is our sphere of influence. This is the Earth. The atmosphere that, that bounds the Earth, that gives us life, is like four sheets of paper on a basketball. And the lowest sheet, the bottom of that lowest sheet, is where we live and what we can survive in. Above that layer, when we go into the death zone, the stratosphere, where we will be going, where spacecraft have to transit, is a very dangerous and harsh place. But it's also very beautiful. As you can see in the slide, you can actually see the layers of the atmosphere. This makes up about 500,000 feet or so. 
And this is why people go to space. Sure, it's fun to be in microgravity, but the real reason they go is the view. And you can get a great view from a balloon at 100,000 feet, just as, as good as you can get in a spacecraft that's flying in orbit. This is a very dangerous place. All of the fatalities in human spaceflight have occurred in ascent or reentry and landing in that lower part of the stratosphere. We have to go back so we can go forward. In the 60s, the US military and the Russian military used the stratospheric balloon to test their life support systems and their escape systems. And this was uh, three of the flights that Joe Kittinger made from the, uh, Excel in the Excelsior series from the stratosphere. He jumped three times, and on two of those occasions, he almost died. One was the first jump he made, was he went into a flat spin and passed out. And the last jump, as he was going up an altitude, his pressure suit lost seal in his glove and his hand swelled up. We'll talk a little bit about some of that in just a second. The Russians, at the same time, unbeknownst to us, also had a very robust flight test program to test crew escape systems. And they had two test parachutists that also made jumps from the stratosphere, and one of them did not survive because his pressure suit failed. So Felix was the third person to successfully go into the realm of the stratosphere and survive. The outcome of those early tests in using stratospheric balloons was that the first spacecraft that flew humans on the Russian side and the US side had escape systems. On the left you see the uh, ejection seat from the Vostok rockets that six times brought crews successfully back to Earth. And on the right, the Mercury Redstone was, was configured for an individual crew escape system for those first two flights. So as we are now learning from our project, we will have advances for future commercial space endeavors. So here's Felix at 70,000 feet getting ready to do his free fall. This is a very dangerous realm. And my team, made up of, of physicians and physiologists and rescue specialists, are all volunteers, are dedicated to one thing, bringing him back alive safely. His primary means of support on the way up is the capsule which provides life support once he opens the capsule to do his, his free fall, he's totally dependent on the, suit, on the, on the uh, pressure suit. Should something go awry with the pressure suit, we have uh, protocols that are in place to essentially uh, recover him and potentially uh, save his life if the suit failed. In the 60s, to try to understand some of the uh, adverse outcomes of this environment, the Air Force dropped mannequins. 200 of these uh, instrumented dummies, crash test dummies, fell in the skies of New Mexico. Many of them were lost and they were the precursor to the, um, to the uh, UFO alien conspiracy. I'm serious. Here's a video uh, of some of the test jumps and Joe Kitt, you're talking about it. falling from very high altitude could enter a violent spin and this could be fatal to a man. So we ended up looking at how do you prevent it from happening. Another concern we have is the extreme low pressures of the, the vacuum of space. It can lead to hypoxia and inadequate oxygen. It can also lead to decompression sickness or the bends. Or any of you who are scuba divers, you might be familiar with it. And this is a video, an electric, uh, a, uh, echocardiogram showing bubbles in the right side of the heart that are uh, occurring in somebody who's in a low pressure chamber during a test. The worst problem that you can face is in the vacuum of space above 63,000 feet is that the water that makes up 70% of our body can turn spontaneously from a water gas, a, a liquid state to a gaseous state. Felix is in the chamber here and this is a bottle of water at room temperature, spontaneously boiling. So this is the phenomenon called ebulism where your, your blood boils. And this actually is survivable if, it's, if you can get back to Earth uh, within a minute or so. People that have survived this said the, the thing they remembered was their tongue boiling. 
was like a fizzy on it. Now, if you stay up there for any length of time, you incur significant damage. The damage you see here, uh, comparing the normal lung on the left and the, and the lung exposed to vacuum on the right, causes this massive disruption. And we've developed a treatment protocol to uh, uh, treat this in the field should he have a loss of pressure from his suit. So here's what keeps him alive on a normal day. It's a pressure suit, heavily modified, and a big part of our test program is to, uh, is to uh, learn everything we can from this program. The lessons learned from this will be applied to future spacecraft. Now, the last job I had at NASA was in, involved with the uh, spacecraft survival investigation team that analyzed the Columbia mishap. And what you see there, that little dot that says D21 is the crew module. And uh, my time working at NASA at the, uh, in my last job was, was basically to try to understand all of the bad things that can happen to you. Many people said that no matter what, the crew would have never survived. This is the video of, a, of the breakup that the final breakup where the crew eventually perished was about 150,000 feet, a mere 30,000 feet above the altitude we'll be doing our test jumps at. And those people said, well, there was nothing we could do about it, and my goal is to prove them wrong. We should never accept defeat and never acknowledge failure. This Stratus mission is a very personal journey for me. My wife was on the Columbia mission, and she perished with the rest of her crew. And I dedicated my life after this to improving crew escape and survival in spacecraft. And I believe that one should follow their passion and live their dream, no matter what the cost. Thank you.